Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast, focusing on what's important to the total Army community. We bring vital Army conversations and interviews on issues relevant to soldiers, military families, and all of you amazing Army supporters. Rotating each week, our show includes Soldier Today, Leading Great Teams, Family Voices, and Thought Leaders. Let's tune into the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Army Matters. I'm Colonel Retired Scott Halstead, and today I'm honored to have a discussion with Major General D.A. Sims. Over his 31-year career, General Sims has built and led lethal, cohesive, and honorable teams in the Army, through Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. General Sims is currently the Commanding General of the 1st Infantry Division stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, and many of his units are deployed to Europe to reassure our NATO allies and deter future Russian aggression. General Sims, thank you so much for joining us today from your deployed headquarters in Poland. How are you and your soldiers doing? Yeah, we're doing good, Scott. Thanks for having me. Well, so I often get asked, you know, how and why I reach out to certain Army leaders to join the Leading Great Teams podcast. And this one was a no-brainer. I've known General Sims for uh, about 35 years. And, uh, you know, we were roommates at West Point. We've served together both in the continental United States, in Iraq and Afghanistan. But really more importantly is I know many of the more junior leaders in the Big Red One and their feedback on the command climate and the emphasis on leader development is unlike anything I've ever heard in my time in the Army. As you know, this is a podcast about leadership. Are there any lessons that you learned in the early stages of your Army career that have stuck with you to this day? Well, I'd tell you, Scott, if I don't go back to the 35 years ago, I'd be wrong, right? I'll miss a chance here. I think certainly my leader development started probably before the academy, certainly in school with coaches and family and, and others. But it certainly started to, to grow when I was at the academy, being with people like you and and others in our class who we would see over and over in and out of combat over the course of our careers. And they provided examples, both good and bad, right, that we were able to learn from uh, the beginning of our careers, uh, the 82nd. And at the end of our careers, or you know where we are right now in our in our lives, and so uh, it certainly started there, in that room in Old Grant or New Grant or wherever we lived, and went from there. It's not hard for me to talk about particular moments that I think have really shaped who I am as an Army officer. I tell young officers this story all the time. You know, I went to the Second Ranger Battalion as a lieutenant, and uh, working with some amazing people. And I remember being in my company CP with my platoon sergeant. Alex Samova, and I'm working on a live fire packet. In walks Staff Sergeant Peng, and he's got a brand new soldier. Kid's been with us for about two months, Private Smith. And he says, uh, hey, sir, you have a minute? Sure, I have a minute. No problem. Put the pencil down, and I'm listening. He says, sir, he said, uh, Private Smith, uh, last month, he didn't get $40 in his paycheck. And, uh, and we went to finance, and we tried to take care of it. And but again, this month, he didn't get his $40, and we were hoping that you could help us get that $40. And, I, you know, I'm a lieutenant, right? I mean, I'm all about solving problems. I love that. And I said, I remember saying to him, I was like, hey, Smitty, I got this. Don't you worry about it. And you could see the visible relief on the kid's face. They leave, door shuts. I pick the pencil back up, and I start working on the live fire packet. Sergeant First Class Samoba looks over me, and he says, hey, sir, what are you doing? I said, Tell him I'm working on that live fire pack. I mean, you know what I'm doing. I'm working on live fire pack. He says, yeah, but what about that 40 bucks? And I said, hey, I'll get that. He says, hey, sir, if Private Smith went to his squad leader to get a problem solved and he couldn't solve it, and then with his squad leader came down the hall and came in to see you, his platoon leader, that's the biggest problem in his life. Right. That $40 may not be that much to you. You know, you may spend that this weekend, you know, on dinner, or beer, or whatever. But that $40 to Private Smith may be the difference between gas money for his family, food money, uh, diapers for his child. You don't know. Man, I put that pencil down and I ran out of that room to go and find that 40 bucks. I'm really lucky. I get to command this incredible division. And the problems that come to me, they're not the $40 problems anymore. But they're still the most important problems or challenges in people's lives. If they make it to me, then they're pretty important things. Yeah, I love that story. That's one of the themes I hear a lot in this podcast is, you know, commission officers that talk about their platoon sergeant or their company level first sergeant 
and the impact that senior non-commissioned ha officer had on them, that's what the Army's all about. You know, accomplishing the mission and taking care of, of your soldiers are, they've never been mutually exclusive. And certainly, I know you do both to an incredibly high standard. Any leaders that you grew up in under during the Army that had a huge impact on you? And if so, why? The first one was my battalion commander when I was a company commander at the 501st, a guy named Jim Paulsha. When I got to Alaska, my mom, she was struggling with cancer. And so we were going on a big field problem and I was kind of the middle, literally the middle of nowhere. And over the radio, my RTO comes out, my driver, he says, uh, hey, sir, I uh, just got a radio call. You get a Red Cross message and your mom, they think your mom has got about 24 hours before she passes. And another radio call comes right after that. Somebody that had heard that over the FM net that said, hey, we're, we're a CH-47, we're en route to such and such, but we can swing by and pick you up in 30 minutes if you can get to the airfield at Greeley, and we'll get you up to Fairbanks. So I looked at my first sergeant, Chris Kilwer, amazing, another extraordinary non-commissioned officer, and he just looks at me and says, sir, go. And I said, first sergeant, I said, I just, how can I leave? The battalion's coming up here. He's like, hey, we got it, sir. We got it. Right. So I leave a note for my battalion commander. They race me over, and I get on this helicopter. Helicopter takes me right to the airport in Fairbanks, drops me off. Wow. I get in on a flight, flies me down to Fort Rich to, to link up with Faye, uh, my wife. Next morning, get a phone call. It's on this crackly net, and it's Lieutenant Colonel Paulsha. And I said, sir, I am so sorry I just took off like that. I should not have done that. And he says, what? He says, hey, never talk about that again. What's the status of your mom? And I told him, and he said, okay, you go home. We've got this. You got a great XO. First Sergeant's amazing. We got it. Don't you worry about anything back here. I end up, I'm there for, you know, a couple of weeks and she's still living. And I call back and I'm like, hey, sir, wanted to give you a sit rep. And he goes, uh, he goes, what are you, what are you doing? And I said, sir, I said, I just wanted to give you an idea where I'm at. I'm, I, I can get back here. He goes, I'm very serious. Take care of your family. Right. I fly back to work after about three weeks at home. The day after I get back to Alaska, she passes. I end up flying back. Never would have had that time with my mother right? if my boss hadn't done that. And even the time I took wouldn't have been the same if he hadn't been you know, very forceful about, listen, your focus is your family. We're good back here. We got it. And I've, I've tried to carry that with me my whole career, you know, that I'd have never gotten that three weeks back in my life if I hadn't gone. The other person I was going to mention, and this is full disclosure, um, the president of AFSA, Retired General Bob Brown was my brigade commander when I was a brigade operations officer as a major uh, in combat, worked with some uh, some shady other majors that you may know. <laughs> I do. He's the other one that really helped shape not just who I became as an Army officer, but who I've become as a person. You know, he's one of those people that he gives you intent and he empowers you and he trusts you. And I found, you know, if, if you can replicate that, people they become better and they grow and it makes the organization better and stronger and the organization grows. So I'd say, I mean, those two in particular really kind of raised me in terms of where I am as an army officer. Two incredible stories. You know, you know, my dad, my, my dad was in the mountain phase of ranger school carrying a radio and an RI came up and said, Hey, who's roster? So-and-so. And it's like, you know, Sergeant, that's me. He goes, your dad just died. And so <laughs> amazing. He, my dad didn't expect this. You know, he, you know, they let him leave ranger school for a couple of days. You know, he got a, a uniform from someone else, flew back to Colorado, buried his dad, took care of his mom for like, you know, 48 hours and then rejoined the ranger class. And my dad still talks about that all these years later, that what an impact it had on a young leader that, hey, the army cares, even in a place like ranger school where, you know, the conditions are horrific. And, and then to, to go to your point, working for then Colonel Bob Brown, he hasn't changed. I mean, this, the environment of trust and autonomy that exists here is incredible. And so, yeah, the, it's amazing what you can do with a team. Speaking of teams, you're now the commander of the 1st Infantry Division, known as the Big Red One, because of the historic patches that you and your soldiers proudly wear. Was it a little intimidating when you took over this heralded division? And has the intensity increased with your current deployment to Poland? You know, what we're doing here now is really, you, you kind of mentioned it before, you know, we're in, we're in this reassure allies and deter Russian aggression. As I walk around and talk to our partners here, our allies, you know, I mention to them all the time. I'm like, listen, 
this division started to come to Europe. The first thing we did was come to Europe in 1917, 1918. Right. And we came back. Right. First, we landed in North Africa, but it wasn't part of Europe. But then we landed in Sicily, and then we landed in Normandy, and we stayed here for a while. And the division's got some incredible history in Europe. And so here we are again, back on European soil, a little bit further east than we've typically been. Right. There's great responsibility and stress that comes with wearing this patch. You know, this red one on their shoulder. I got a note today. In fact, uh, a retired Lieutenant Colonel Charlie Horner, who was a field artilleryman in Vietnam, he passed away today. And I get a note from the Society of the First Infantry Division. They had sent it to all of the society members talking about Charlie Horner's contribution in Vietnam. Charlie Horner retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. But throughout his life, would associate himself with the 1st Infantry Division. And there are other people out there who make that same connection. And they expect the people over here, the men and women over here who are wearing it again in Europe, to represent them. There's a lot of stress that comes with that and a lot of pressure. Right. But I tell guys all the time, the reason that I don't feel it and that you shouldn't feel that pressure is because in a heartbeat, the men and women next to you, would pick you up and run through burning fire to take care of you. And if you've got those kind of people on your left and your right, you don't need to be overly stressed about it. Periodically, you're going to pick somebody up. Periodically, they're going to carry you. But it is such an amazing, amazing history. We're going to take a quick break and then return with more stories from General D.A. Sims. Have you purchased your AUSA swag yet? Be proud to show your support for AUSA which in turn shows your support for the U.S. Army and our soldiers. Check out all AUSA swag at shop.ausa.org. Welcome back. We're here with my West Point roommate and dear friend, General D.A. Sims. Now, D.A., you've developed a well-earned reputation as a coach, mentor, and a commander that really focuses on leader development. Can you tell us more about Operation Victory Wellness and why did you initiate this program for the 1st Infantry Division? Yeah, it's, it's really two things, Scott. First is it's about making everybody individually stronger and more resilient. And the second is about making our team stronger. Right. When you and I were in Iraq, I came back and I went to US SOCOM and uh, I lived on this great street in Florida and nobody did their own lawns, but I did. <laughs> but also across the street from me were a couple, Nadine and Tony, and they would also mow their own yard. And so we'd end up having a beer together after we mowed our yards. Nadine was a professor at the University of South Florida, and she specialized in post-traumatic stress. And I would tell her, I just come back from Iraq. And I said, I don't get it. You know, you and I walk into the same room. We see the exact same thing. We come out. One of us has a bad reaction. The other doesn't. It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, it's got to be weakness. And she'd say, well, you're an idiot. And then she would go on to explain why I was so wrong. Well, this went on for like two and a half years. <laughs> so I get to battalion command and um, deployed Afghanistan. I changed command on the 27th of July. On the 29th of July, I, uh, I sign in, quote unquote, to MIT, where I was doing a War College Fellowship. I was in two opposite worlds, right? And I did not react very well. Right. Just like you, I married a really incredible woman and very, very smart, much smarter than me. And so in November that year, we're sitting on the pool deck while our daughter's taking a swim lesson and we're talking about something. And she says, are you okay?" I said, of course, I'm okay. Why why wouldn't I be okay?" She said, well, the way you just said what you said was a little off and you're about six months post deployment. Maybe something's going on. Maybe you ought to talk to somebody. I said, I'm fine, Faye. Right. So a week later. I'm taking the post-deployment health reassessment online, the thing that we all answer no to, right? Because if you answer yes, somebody's going to talk to you. And this time I actually read all the questions and I'm like, huh, some of these actually apply to me. Well, one more week later, I'm with another one of our classmates. I'm having dinner with him and, um, and he had also commanded an infantry battalion. He was in Iraq, same time I was in Afghanistan. And we're talking about it. He says, yeah, he says, you know, I went to military one source. And I said, what? And he's like, yeah, I went to military one source. It was fantastic. At the time, it was 10 free counseling appointments. Nobody, you know, off post. Nobody knew anything about it. He says it was it was fantastic. And I thought to myself about these three consecutive, you know, weeks and these things that happened to me. And I thought, you know, gosh, maybe I should talk to somebody. And so, again, long story longer, that's exactly what happened. 
So now I go and I talk to somebody. I'm having a reaction. I'm at MIT. I got incredible instructors and professors. And they're like, hey, maybe you should look into this. Do a little research on, on what's going on here with this kind of stuff. So I did. And I went down to meet with a comprehensive soldier and family fitness director. And I'm telling him this story. So he shows me this slide. And, and the bottom line is, when I would talk to Nadine, basically what she would tell me is, you know, listen, this is all, you know, your reaction to stress is all about, you know, your socioeconomic status, education level, your family support structure, your spirituality, all these different things, all those same things that Nadine had talked about all those years before, all those things that made up that individual resilience for that person. So I thought a bunch about this and I was going into brigade command. I was going back to the same place I'd commanded the battalion. And uh, we were going right back to Afghanistan six months after I took command. When I went into brigade command, I told guys, I said, you know, it's crazy. Every day we do physical training and we work on our physical strength. But when you think about it, our physical strength only gets us so far. We take something that's not even that hard. Take a 12 mile foot march. Why do I make it to a 12 mile foot march and somebody stops at mile eight? I mean, it's typically not because of their physical ability. It's because they start talking themselves out of this. They tell themselves, hey, my feet hurt or my shoulders hurt. And they just, they quit and they stop. Right. Well, if that's the case, then why do we take every single day and work on our physical strength, but not a single day to work on our emotional strength, our family strength, our spiritual strength, our social strength? I said, hey, we're going to do it a little bit different. So I'm going to take every 10th day of PT away from you. And instead of doing PT, we're going to do things to work on individual resilience. And they're like, what? <laughs> you and I are both coming to commanders. We both went to the advanced course. At no point did they talk to, to us in the advanced course about wellness, right? And so we created a, a book that divided the five dimensions of strength. And then when you went in there, it told you, gave you the who, what, when, where, and why of different resources to help you. So for that morning session, you could call the MWR folks and lay on yoga if you wanted to work on emotional uh, strength or spiritual strength. You could call on the yoga people come down and in that morning run that for you. You know, outdoor rec for bikes or you know financial ed and bring the financial ed people in. And so we, we did that. So DA, what was the overall reaction to that? I imagine that you got some resistance to these changes. People were at first really uncomfortable. I didn't want people to be able to say no. And so what we did was we took Inflax, right, our military family life counselors. Over the course of three and a half, four months, every returning member of, of the regiment had to go and sit down for a minimum 30-minute counseling session with an Inflax. You couldn't leave. You didn't have to say a word. And I told people, I said, listen, I can't order you to say a single word in there, but I can order that your place of duty is sitting in that room where a counselor also happens to be sitting. Right. Then I told the counselors, listen, I would think good counselors can get somebody to talk. So when a kid comes in there and you say, hey, anything on your mind? And they go, nope. You look at your watch and you go, okay, well, hey, we got 29 minutes and 45 seconds left. What do you think? Steelers, will they be able to do it with a new quarterback? And then a kid looks up and says, Steelers, if you don't want to talk about the Cleveland Browns, I don't even want to talk. Right. And then the next thing you know, a conversation ensues. And what we found in that case was 45 minutes would go by like that. The counselor would have to say, hey, I don't want to cut you off, but blah, 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 blah. I got an, another appointment. Well, we, we had pretty decent results. I changed command and Faye and I went to the Bonhoeff in Nuremberg and we were going to take the train down to Munich to fly home. And we're sitting at the Bonhoeff and Faye says to me, she says, well, what do you think? Right. Two hours out of command. She says, what do you think? And I said, you know, Faye, I didn't say anything to anybody about this. And when I tell you this, I know that there's a there's a bunch of luck involved in this in this statement. But in our entire time in command, we didn't have a suicide in the brigade, not one. And I've got to believe that there were times there where people might have been kind of a, a low point in their lives and they latched on to something, something with that work on resilience, something that helped them in terms of strength, something that helped them get through that moment where they might have thought about it. And, and again, there's a lot of luck in there, right? I'm not making a claim, but there's a lot of luck. Sure. So fast forward, and I find I'm coming to one ID. I called Dr. Amy Adler, who had worked at the Wall Street Army Institute of Research the first time. I called Amy and I said, hey, Amy, I'm going to one ID and we're going to do this wellness thing, but we're going to do it on steroids, right? We're going to do it at Fort Riley. Because now you can, you can mass resources now as a division commander. 
not only am I the, the division commander, but I'm the senior mission commander. Yeah. So I can tell the division, hey, we're going to do this. And then I can tell the garrison, hey, I need you to support this. And so the resources at the garrison, it just created this incredible synergy, not to mention the fact that we've incorporated our civilian employees as well as all of our military folks that aren't wearing big red one patches at Fort Riley. I'm amazed. One, I'm proud of, of what you have done to build strong individuals and, and strong teams. It probably does good for, for young soldiers and young leaders to go, hey, that's, that's my squadron commander just walked out of that's. That's the division command star major. He just walked out of that. If they can do that, so can I. Here's something crazy. If you're in an organization where the leaders not just endorse the program, but participate in the program, mm -hmm. your unit vice another unit that doesn't has a, a level of trust and a level of cohesion 30% higher than the other one. Well, holy smokes, 30% higher. Who wouldn't just do that? But then you start thinking about it, and it, it's not as mind-blowing as, as you would think, because your best officers are not commissioned officers. They don't come up with a great PT program and then turn to their platoon sergeants and platoon leaders and say, okay, execute P, uh, platoon PT, guys. I'll be in here drinking coffee with the first sergeant. Those platoon or those company commanders and first sergeants are out doing PT with their squads. And so those squads, naturally, they think, gosh, my company commander is a rock star, right? PT is important. Okay, right. Yeah. When the stuff at first, I started seeing the results come back and I was like, whoa, that's crazy. And then you're like, of course, those are better units, right? Of course, those are better units. Right. So, yeah, it's really something. Yeah, I'm, I'm blown away. This, I really appreciate your, your perspective on this and what you're doing to, to build and lead just incredibly strong teams in the first infantry division. Let's finish up by talking about your professional reading list. What are you reading? What's important to you? What do you share with your teammates to inspire them as they continue to be lifelong learners? You know, I was thinking about reading lists when I was kind of thinking about this podcast. You know, the first book I read that I still tell people if they haven't read as an army officer, they have to. I read because of a, an infantry lieutenant colonel in BSNL, uh, behavioral sciences and, and leadership at West Point, who was one of my professors there and said, hey, if you, I told him, I said, I want to be an instrument. He said, well, okay, if, if that's what you want to be, you got to read the book Once an Eagle, right? So I read Once an Eagle and he was right, right? I mean, I finished that book and I was like, gosh, this is what I want to do. My first aid, I gave him a copy as we were coming out and I talked to him about it the same way. He had read it. I said, Matt, it's not about reading the book once. It's about reading it over your career. Because when you read it at different times in your career, different parts of that book are much more impactful to you. He's earning the Medal of Honor. But then you get later into his career and you see the things that he struggles with. And so I think you can grow throughout that book. Now, I guess two years ago now, the memoirs of uh, Ulysses S. Grant, that was amazing. Best nonfiction I've ever read. Incredible. Truth Worth Telling by Scott Pelley, the news anchor. Right. It's stories about his career, 60 Minutes before that on, on CBS News and before that. But then the last chapter is I took this chapter. I probably violated them. Well, I know I violated the copyright. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I can go to jail for saying that. But I made a copy of the last chapter. I think it's four or five pages. The last chapter is called How Many Stars Are in Your Flag? And it basically talks about the fact that in our country, with all of the various, you know, discussions and people on one side or another side, the blue portion of the flag is called the union. You may be one star in there and you may be, you know, we have 50 states, but they're all bound inside the union. This chapter talks about that. And I remember copying that and sending it to my daughter at a particular crazy time over the last couple of years, just saying, hey, listen, it's, it's all OK. Right. This is a country that's been through a lot and we'll be we'll be OK. We'll be stronger um, as a country. But that's another great one. I love it. I'm going to pick up the Scott Pelley book because I love watching him on 60 Minutes. And well, General Sims, any closing comments for our listeners? Anything you want to share that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet? You know, the beauty of this profession is that it's based on our people. I think when all the dust settles in this fight between Russia and Ukraine and one of the things they're going to find is that. The, the real reason that the Russian army is not nearly as good as they think they are is because they just don't have the same kind of people. They don't have a, a culture in which people are empowered. They don't have a non-commissioned officer corps that is, is charged with making decisions and taking initiative. They don't have an officer corps that genuinely cares about the men and women that they're leading. 
and that is concerned that when they make a decision to tell them to enter and clear a room, that they do that and the soldier knows that, listen, if they're telling me to do that, they've thought through the risks and they know that by me going in there, it's worth the risk. That comes because we we do care about one another, right? And that started back in, in those rooms uh, at the academy with us and grew over time. So for our listeners, I'm, I'm totally biased. Now you've heard that uh, General Sims and I've known each other for almost our entire lives. and and But I can say this completely from the heart, and, and that is there are very few people in our Army that can build and lead a cohesive, a strong, an honorable team like you. And so I'm incredibly proud of what you've done. And as you said, this profession, you're surrounded by people that they make you want to get better. Well, DA, that's how you've been for me since I was 17 years old, and I think you were 19. I'm so proud of what you and your leaders have done in the Big Red One. And as you know, you've talked to my dad is a Big Red One veteran from the Vietnam War. And so my whole life, I have heard more than I care no mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great, duty first. And so I will call my dad tonight and say, Dad, you'll never believe I, I had this incredible conversation with a big red one soldier who has continued to build upon the legacy of of those great men and women who started this thing off, you know, in 1917 and are back in Europe, continuing to uh, defend our national interests and reassure our allies and partners. Thank you so much from a deployed headquarters, making time to talk to about leadership and, and all the things you've done to strengthen our army. It's great to talk to you, Scotty. You tell your dad that we're trying to live up to his example. Absolutely. Real honor to be with you. Thank you for having me. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army day. Hua. <laughs>